I'm Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. We're in conversation with Nathaniel Fick, U.S. Ambassador at Large for Cyberspace and Digital Policy. Let me say just a little bit more about the ambassador in his previous life. He was a technology executive and entrepreneur. He was CEO of the cybersecurity software company Endgame from 2012 through to its acquisition by Elastic in 2019. Also spent a decade as an operating partner at Bessemer Venture Partners and was head of the Center for New American Security in DC. Earlier in his career, he was a Marine Corps infantry and reconnaissance officer. And he wrote about his experiences in his book, one bullet away. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to be here. Let's have a seat. Thank you. Um, just a quick housekeeping for the audience. Uh, start posting your questions. Uh, we will have a Q&A period, but if you hear something um, that we're talking about and you want to post your questions early, I've got my laptop here, and I'll actually be glancing while we're having conversation. So if there's something relevant that pops up, we can just get to the questions straight away. Also, um, upvote, because then I, this is a democracy. That way I know uh, which questions people want answered the most. Um, so, Ambassador, I just want to start by asking the very basics. Um, the Bureau of Cyberspace and Digital Policy is fairly new. So what is its vision and what does it do? Well, I don't think I have to tell this audience, Melissa, that technology is changing every aspect of our lives. Uh, it's obviously changing every aspect of our foreign policy as well. And it's intrinsically transnational, uh, like climate, uh, and it's intrinsically multi-stakeholder. Uh, most of the expertise doesn't sit in governments. It sits in civil society, it sits in companies. Uh, and so the Bureau is our effort to integrate and elevate the United States approach to technology diplomacy around the world. And our North Star, our vision, is a future that is uh, anchored on an internet that is open and free, interoperable, reliable, and secure. It's a positive, affirmative, inclusive, attractive, compelling vision uh, focused on the good that technology can do in all of our lives. Can you give an example of that? I mean, that's the broad stroke, but an example of something that your uh, division is doing. Sure. So we have uh, a handful of organizations. Uh, we focus on cybersecurity policy, where uh, we're, we're building capacity in cybersecurity all around the world uh, to help uh, civil society organizations, companies, governments uh, defend themselves from cyber attacks. Uh, we are focused on information and communications technology policy, so uh, secure networks, trusted networks, um, making sure that the cable, the fiber, the data centers, the wireless networks, the satellites that undergird all of our connectivity globally are open and reliable and secure. Uh, we're focused on emerging tech, this whole basket of fascinating, um, promising, sometimes intimidating new technology areas like artificial intelligence that uh, are going to transform our economies and transform the way we live. Uh, and we need to make sure that we put the guardrails in place so that we harness the good and avoid the bad. Uh, and all of it is built on a foundation of human rights, um, our values, and, and a, a, a north star of digital freedom. Um, you talk about the transnational nature and the multi-stakeholder nature, and that's definitely true, but we're also in an era where there are a lot of countries that are closing its borders, uh, creating their own alternate internet, and China has taken the lead with its great firewall and its own, pretty much its own intranet. And you also talk about multi-stakeholder um, at a time when I feel like there are many people who cannot really participate because of the authoritarian states that they're in. Could you talk a little bit about that? So I go back to the 20 year diplomatic process at the United Nations that culminated in the framework for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And this is a, really a three part agreement, uh, an agreement to extend um, the body of international law that protects everyone's rights in the physical world, to extend that online rather than creating something new. Um, a set of norms governing state behavior in peacetime online and then a set of confidence building measures to avoid inadvertent escalation. And I, I bring it up because it was classic ground game diplomacy. You know, one yard in a cloud of dust for 20 years that resulted in this very robust um, set of guidance 
that has been endorsed unanimously and repeatedly by every UN member state, every country in the world. So, including China, including Russia. Um, and that's extraordinary, and it's kind of a superpower. Now, to your point, not every state that has agreed to that is actually abiding by it. It's not self-enforcing. And so it's incumbent upon all of us, I think, governments, civil society, uh, to hold states accountable and, and articulate kind of our conviction in the importance of that unifying vision. I mean, let's talk about AI. I mean, a lot of people talking about regulating and the need to have some sort of, um, you know, discussion at the international level. Uh, going back to China or Russia again, I mean, they're the obvious examples. But let's, let's uh, think about it. India as well. Uh, they seem to want to go their own way when it comes to approaching technology. So um, w that's a challenge. So I think two things at the same time can be true. Um, and I spent most of my adult life as a technology investor and entrepreneur. Uh, so with respect to AI, uh, I believe very strongly that we need to maintain the kind of regulatory framework that does not undermine our ability to innovate because we are in a competition. I understand the fear, uh, the concern behind that, that letter that we saw recently, the call for a pause. But the problem is our adversaries aren't gonna pause. And they have a very different vision for how these technologies will be used in the world. A vision that's not rights respecting. A vision that's not inclusive. Uh, and so we have to, on the one hand, maintain our innovative edge in like-minded countries, largely democracies, but not exclusively, countries that are, uh, that are rights respecting in this regard. And at the same time, recognize that risk and and reward, uh, risk and reward really are, are correlated. There, there are a lot of rewards with AI, but there are also risks. And so we do have to put guardrails in place. Uh, I'm in favor of putting them in place very quickly. We're not gonna get a fully developed regime immediately. The uh, time from 1945 and the detonation of the first atomic weapon to the creation of the International Atomic Energy Agency in 1957, 12 years. Mm -hmm. We don't have 12 years, so we need to start fast. I think the quickest start is with voluntary guidelines from the major AI uh, model developers, and then that's a starting point. It's not the ending point. We can work then in a multilateral way around the world to add to that and figure out the regime that works. Now, a lot of people are making that analogy with uh, the, the uh, agreements concerning nuclear weapons. Um, uh, but also, I do feel like uh, the agreements made decades ago, we're in a very different era right now, right? Um, people talk about a multipolar world, not a by, you know, at the, in, during the Cold War, there were two major powers. So um, how does that complicate things for these, thing, these goals you sort of stated? So I came of age in the era at the end of the Cold War and the years after when we had serious conversations about the end of history or the world being flat. Yeah. And it turns out the world's not flat and history didn't end. Uh, so I, th I think, again, um, we have to do two things simultaneously. We have to continue to articulate and believe in the power of that affirmative vision for what these technologies can do to connect the two and a half billion people globally who are still unconnected or intentionally disconnected by their governments. Uh, to spur advances in things like healthcare and education and connectivity for all people. We have to stay anchored on that. That is the North Star. And at the same time, uh, we do have to hold states to account when they engage in behavior that undermines freedom of the press, that undermines uh, the freedom of organization and civil society organizations in their governments, uh, in, their, in their countries. So we, we have to do both. There's a, an affirmative vision and an accountability mechanism. You talk about the affirmative vision, um, but the, when you look at big tech and, and so many people have been impacted, I mentioned this yesterday, have been impacted negatively here at RightsCon as activists by big tech. The major big tech companies are in the United States. Uh, so in some ways, when you're approaching other countries and talking to them, uh, they're looking at the harm from Facebook. I mean, somebody like Maria Reza, the Nobel Peace Prize recipient, right, and journalist has said that she believes Facebook is the biggest threat to democracy, and it's an American company. That's hard to square when you try to convince people to hear your vision, no? So at my core, I am proud of and supportive of the innovation culture in the United States that has created 
the flourishing of these global companies. And I think that on balance, they are enormous forces for good and progress over time. At the same time, uh, I think the era of laissez-faire techno-capitalism is over, and it should be over. Uh, because these companies and the t their technologies have become so all-encompassing and so powerful and so influential that there are regulatory guidelines that are necessary in order to safeguard human rights and privacy, in order to ensure uh, that we, that we uh, don't see rampant misinformation and disinformation. We shouldn't be arguing about truth in the public sphere. Uh, we're entitled to opinions. We're not entitled to our own facts, right? It's sort of the basis of democratic discourse. So. Uh, I think that we are going to see, uh, you saw uh, President Biden wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal earlier this year calling for federal privacy regulation in the United States, calling for platform accountability, algorithmic transparency. Uh, our national cybersecurity strategy uses words like regulation and liability and insurance uh, in ways that are, uh, are new and important, I think, in the U.S. I mean, but you talk about, plat I mean, it's great that he talks about platform accountability, and you do too, and yeah, I'm not entirely sure I'm convinced, I guess, that the era of laissez-faire techno-capitalism is over. I mean, uh, let's look at Twitter, right? <laughs> um, right now, there's so much disinformation, misinformation, anti-Semitic comments. It's run by one person, and frank frankly, from what I understand, financed by Saudi Arabia and uh, the, 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 uh, the company Binance, with this mysterious Chinese crypto billionaire who's actually now under investigation in the United States. Again, going back uh, to, to, to that, it, it's a hard thing. I, I mean, I imagine it must be hard in your shoes to be in your shoes. How do you convince people that you're taking everything you're saying uh, should be taken seriously when, again, people, I mean, a lot of people here use Twitter, right? Um, and they're seeing what's happening right now. Far fewer people here use Twitter than used it last year. And if you believe press reporting, Twitter's ad revenue is down something like 60%. So there is accountability in the marketplace as well. In addition to government regulation, I do think that the, to some degree in free markets, the market speaks. And we'll see. Either Twitter will remain a trusted place for discourse or it won't. And that's up to, to a large degree, uh, Twitter's management. Yeah, and I also understand, of course, to, to underscore that, I mean, your remit is not uh, stuff happening in the domestic United States. You're, you're outward facing, so. Uh, I know I'm focusing a lot on, on, on the U.S. Um, side. Now, many people attending RightsCon would note that the EU, in many respects, and I'm based in Berlin, so I see this a lot, appears to be ahead of the United States in terms of uh, tech regulation. Um, could you talk about that? So I think the simple paradigm, um, and this is an oversimplification, and I've had European counterparts say this to me, is that the United States operates and Europe regulates. Um, that's insufficient on both sides. We need the U.S. to do both, and we need Europe to do both. Uh, take uh, telecom technology as a good example. 30 years ago, if you and I had been sitting here having this conversation in 1993, uh, we had trusted providers around the world, uh, Samsung, uh, Nokia, Ericsson, Bell Labs, Alcatel, Lucent, Motorola. We had a, law, a robust ecosystem. Uh, that ecosystem has shrunk dramatically, and uh, uh, other providers, largely Chinese, have run the table in parts of the world. So as we look forward with Europe, I think it's imperative that we identify areas where we currently have shared technology advantage in rights respecting countries, like we did in telecom and lost it. But look at cloud computing, look at artificial intelligence, look at quantum, and let's be sure that we work together with Europe to defend and extend those areas of advantage so that we don't find ourselves fighting from behind in the same way that we have with telecom. Great. I'm going to just quickly look at my laptop and check to see if anyone has typed any questions. Guys, don't be shy. I'm going to just refresh this and uh, see what there is. Give me one second. Well, while it's loading up, um, I want to talk about China, and there is, I have the background of having been a reporter there. Um, you're saying that the United States wants an open and interoperable space in a lot of these um, technologies. China is doing the opposite. Um, how do you deal with that, I guess, in general? I mean, what's, what's your thinking when it comes to states like China and Russia? So I, I put China and Russia in different categories. So I, I, first, I would, I, would, I would not necessarily uh, lump them together. Uh, with China, um, 
we believe that uh, it's imperative that we, that we invest and we align supply chains and we compete with China. We have very different views of what technology, the role of technology in society uh, and what the future ought to look like in the technological sphere. Um, I don't believe that, that China shares uh, our values with respect to privacy and human rights. Uh, and I don't believe they share our perspective on the importance of uh, trusted communications infrastructure that is not aligned with a government. Um, Russia is a different case. Russia's uh, completely unjustified and outrageous further invasion of Ukraine has made Russia an isolated pariah state. And that's different. So we are proud to stand with Ukraine. Uh, I was with my Ukrainian counterparts in Eastern Europe last week. Uh, working on the digital minister, you mean? Or our digital minister, uh, deputy foreign minister, deputy defense minister, uh, working on our continued uh, technology support to Ukraine, and we stand with Ukraine through the victory and beyond. Um, I want to also uh, ask you about the summit for democracy. I mean, this is a big part of the Biden administration, and I understand that your uh, bureau is also was also part of that. Yes, uh, we we were, and the summit for democracy pulled together. Uh, the gathering in Washington, uh, and there were several around the world, um, I attended the one in Washington, and it pulled together a, a diverse global group of, of people, much like uh, this one here at RightsCon. Um, one of the hallmark, I, I think, uh, announcements at the Summit for Democracy was the spyware executive order in the United States, uh, um, a, uh, an executive order banning U.S. government use of spyware that uh, can... Uh, Harm, the, harm our government employees and, and be used to violate uh, human rights globally. And how are, uh, are other countries taking up that uh, sort of uh, ban? They are. So uh, we announced it in concert with more than 10 other countries, and we're continuing to build a coalition around it. And that's the hard work of, of diplomacy, right? Uh, put a stake in the ground, build a, a coalition of partners, and then continue to build it. Um, I want to also ask you about semi, I mean, what Freedom House would consider uh, or define as semi-democracies, uh, India, uh, Turkey, um, uh, where, it was particularly with India, they do internet shutdowns, um, but yet the United States also has a strong diplomatic relation with some of these countries that are uh, that have elections, um, but uh, shut down the internet or, or since censor. What kind of um, conversations are you trying to have with your counterparts? Uh, I think the relationships between states are like the relationships between people. They're multifaceted. Rarely are they defined by one thing. Uh, and just like it's possible to agree with a good friend on 90 things and disagree on two, uh, I think it's, it's possible between states. Uh, as a matter of principle, uh, around the world, uh, we, the United States, oppose internet shutdowns. Uh, and support continued open connectivity for all people. Uh, and that's regardless of the perpetrator of the shutdowns. We, we uh, maintain that position uh, even with states uh, where otherwise we have robust partnerships. And at the beginning of the conversation um, just now, you also mentioned um, work in civil society around the world. Could you elaborate on that? And I'm also going to check for questions while you... Yeah. Ab absolutely. So uh, it's a two-way street. We, um, we spend a lot of money uh, every year as the State Department uh, training people or paying for travel and conference attendance, trying to get people from uh, across uh, the world, regardless of uh, national income or political orientation, uh, get people present and participating. Um, and so that's something that, that we can offer to the world. And on the other hand, uh, we try to engage very openly and benefit from the expertise that uh, civil society brings to bear because these people and these organizations are on the front lines. Uh, this is ground truth. It's, it's easy sometimes to spend your time you know, in the cloistered halls of academia or the corporate world or government um, and lose that finger feel sense of what's really important, what works, what doesn't work, what's pragmatic, um, what's realistic. Uh, and so I personally and we as a team spend a lot of time engaging with civil society so that we can listen. Uh, I'm spending a good chunk of time this afternoon here doing exactly that. Right. And there's also capacity building work, right? Yep. Uh, what is your sense of other governments? Are they, 
my, I, I think I know the answer. I mean, no government is investing as much money as it should towards, uh, you know, building out cybersecurity defenses, uh, whether in, uh, among uh, civilians or, or, or government. But I, since you travel around the world and you yeah. deal with this, I'd be curious about that. People are shy, so I'm just going to keep asking let's questions keep, I want. Let's keep I mean, going. If you guys don't so, send questions, then I will, um, I will just go ahead and uh, keep speaking to the ambassador. Look, we're connecting. Uh, billion devices about every quarter globally, and that's accelerating. So the attack surface that we collectively need to visualize and safeguard is becoming increasingly, exponentially complex. So one of the kind of uncomfortable messages that I deliver when I'm talking about cybersecurity around the world is there's no goal line. Um, there's no point at which a government can say, okay, we're good. Right? It's a it's constant effort and it's really about people, process, and technology in that order. It's very tempting to think that there's a tech silver bullet that's gonna solve your problems, but there isn't. So uh, people, first and foremost, uh, governments, companies, organizations of all kinds, we have to invest in the capacity of our people. Our people are simultaneously our first line of defense and our greatest vulnerability, um, usually unwittingly, not for some nefarious reason. And then people, uh, a process, organizing uh, for success, information flow, that kind of thing. How we respond to incidents. Uh, and then the tech, making sure that we do get good tech deployed that's resilient, that's upgradable, that's reliable, that's cost efficient, uh, and that we can do that in a scalable way around the world. And it just continues. Young Bureau, uh, just one year, right? Look, you, you spent time in Silicon Valley, so, uh, failing is, is viewed as a positive thing. Where has the Bureau sort of tripped so far this year that you could give us an example? And then also, of course, give us a success story. Yeah, I, th I think we trip in, uh, in recruiting great people to our, to our mission. Um, I come from a culture that, uh, uh, that is very open to hiring from the outside. Uh, and um, it's, that's hard to do in government. Um, it's hard to do for a lot of bureaucratic reasons. It's hard to do for security clearance reasons. We simply have to get better at it. We, we cannot afford to have silos between civil society, government, companies. Uh, we are gonna be best in this domain when we have the freest possible interflow of talent and ideas among all three. Uh, so one of my commitments, as long as I'm in this role, is to try to make it easier for people to join our team and make it easier for people on our team to go spend time in other organizations and parts of the ecosystem. Great. And success story? I mean, just to give uh, one example that's concrete, you know? Yeah. I, I think uh, we, we delivered, uh, there was a, a terrible Iranian cyber attack in Albania uh, that took down e-Albania uh, and kept it down. Uh, in a way that was really disruptive to the citizens of Albania um, and felt like really an unjust uh, kind of reward for the great work that they had done digitizing their governance, uh, eliminating corruption, connecting the government and the people. They did all the right things and the reward was a massive cyber attack that took down digital Albania. Uh, we in the United States were very quick to organize um, to work with, with our Albanian counterparts and our embassy on the ground in Tirana and put together a $25 million aid package focused largely on capacity building and working with Albania to, to build a robust, resilient digital Albania that is secure. Uh, and we've come a long way in a short period of time. I feel great about it. Great. Uh, final thoughts. Do you have any? Listen, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for the invitation. Thank you to, uh, to Access Now, to the RightsCon team, to Brett Solomon. Uh, I commit, uh, as long as I'm, I'm in this role, to an open door for ideas and talent exchange. Uh, and we really do need all of you to stay involved in this work. It's essential. Uh, so much of our future depends on getting th these things right. And no one of us alone can get them right. It requires all of us. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And that's it from RightsCon main stage. Enjoy the rest of the day. And as always, stay engaged.